Good evening. Uh, well, hopefully everyone is doing well tonight. I'm going to wait here a second to get make sure everything is connected properly. There we go. Looks like it's up. All right, so <clears throat> let's get into... Well, let me flip back here. Uh, where did we leave off? What did we talk about last time? Actually, I found some, some real nice um, PowerPoints um, that actually go over some of this stuff. So uh, other, other professors are also using this exact same textbook. So there are resources if you'd like to find them. You can go out and look. Some of you maybe have already done that. Um, I found one that I really liked, that I, that I like at least. You know, it's, a, it's one from Stanford. So use it if you like. Uh, we might be on some of those pages tonight, uh, just depending on where we get to. All right, so. Uh, ah, I talked a little bit about clocks, but I didn't actually show there's a really neat formula. Uh, so that's where we left off, right? Is on clocks. CPU clock. So I need to t need to say something about this. Every single computer, regardless of how big or small it is, has to have at least one clock in it because it needs to know how quickly or how often to, um, to, to, to process things, to check and look for things. And usually that timing is as quickly as you can possibly get it. Uh, that, uh, that includes on things like, say, your microwave or on your, um, well, probably none of you have an alarm clock. Maybe you do, but uh, there's some alarm clocks don't, don't, aren't digital, so we won't use that as a good example. Uh, what else? Uh, potentially, well, I mean, anything that's electronic, right? So, uh, even as simple as uh, a pedometer. You know, there's if it's got a little screen on it, it has to have some kind of a clock in there. So, anything, think about it, anything that has a digital screen on it has to have a clock including an apple pie, interestingly enough. No, I'm sorry, raspberry pie, not apple pie. That'd be cool if it was apple. That's not. It's raspberry. Okay. So, so here's the thing. This is, and this book gives us this formula. CPU time equals seconds per program. So how long does it take your program to run? Well, there's three parts to it. Instructions Per program, program, it'd be really helpful if I could draw decent. And this M is really sad looking. Oops. Times average. cycles per instruction then most of you can guess what this third one is because we can actually look at this instructions are crossed off program is here on the bottom so that's what we want there so we need seconds on top
and seconds per cycle. And that's usually represented in nanoseconds or milliseconds. So what we can do copy that paste it in here, there we go. What we can do is we can do this. We can cross off instructions and instructions here and then we, let's use green, but, and we can cross off cycles there and cycles there which gives us seconds over program. Okay. What that tells us, right, is how long a program takes to run, right? So there's three different places we can we can work on that. One is instructions per program. It's not necessarily lines per code because it uh, many times one line of code will institute multiple different instructions on an assembly language or machine code level. We'll talk about the difference between those is in, uh, before we get done. But what, right, one line of code, like if I want to store something, I want to take a value, say 42, and I want to store it in a variable, A, or temp. Temp equals 42. Well, there's a bunch of things that I need to do to get the assembly to work. <laughs> Is that first off, I need to associate temp with a memory location. So I need to give it a memory location that will fit the size that it is. Well, how big is it? Well, we don't know yet. Oh, well, that becomes a problem, potentially, right? Because if it was a string, it would require more, potentially more, more characters. But in this case, it's an integer that can just be saved in one byte. So we give it a single byte. Depending on the computer language you're using, sometimes it'll be 32 bits or 4 bytes. That's what Java uses for integers. So I save, save the, I, I get the memory location associated with temp, and then I have to load the value, the raw value, into memory, and then I have to take that and store it into the memory location, which I've gotten from some other kind of program. So so something else has allocated that memory. So it becomes four or five steps. Or, or more, maybe. I don't know. Depends on how, how it gets in, instituted. So that would be how many instructions, right? So it's not just one line of code. Okay. It's important to remember. is And it's not always one-to-one, -one, right? So if I'm going to add two things together, they're just regular values. I need to load both of those into memory. And then I do a plus operation on them. And plus is the simplest of them. Uh... Whereas if I wanted to do a minus or a subtraction, I would need to do a two's complement on one of them, and then I could add them. So there's a lot, right? So that's extra steps that we have to kind of deal with. Um, so it all depends on how many instructions per program is going to be different. But we do know, we can figure out exactly how many instructions there are for the whole program. We need to decrease that somehow. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do that. Then the next thing is the number of cycles per instruction. Because remember, I talked about this early on. The full instruction needs to do a fetch, a decode, a using the thing, and then storing it. So there's it's a cycle that takes four four steps. So it would in that case it would take four steps to do one instruction. But sometimes it only takes two, sometimes it only takes one. Well, usually it takes more than that, but it depends. Sometimes we could get paused. There's all kinds of different things. So there's we could but we could try to do something to improve this. Or most people think this is the only thing that can be fixed, and that's how many seconds does it take to run a cycle? Right, which is that megahertz or gigahertz that we were talking about before. 
Um, and since it's inverse, the when we like when we say one gigahertz machine, that's one billion operations per second, which would be one nanosecond. Then, I believe. All right, but I do wanted to did want to show you guys this. Um, because we're going to come back and we're going to look at each of these. How do we can how we can try to improve these in the future? Okay. Talk briefly about the I/O subsystem. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I.O. devices or input output devices now I showed last time right we had the boss and I, I showed some I.O. devices and I put them directly onto the bus this is actually incorrect it's a way to think about it but they're not I should probably say normally because it, it is possible to do it differently. They're not directly connected to the CPU. We can say there is an interface so what is an interface this is a piece of software that handles tra data transfer. So we'll talk about different ways to do this. There's two main ways to do it. Okay, so there's two main ways to do this. So think about this interface. Usually, sometimes we can also call this the driver. But it's a piece of software that's going to allow us to connect to. So, okay, here's an example. Does the CPU care? It says, hey, I want you to store this thing in the memory. And then tell me where it is, so I, or tell me reference a reference so that I can get back to it. Does it care where it actually goes on the hard drive or on the solid state drive? No. The user doesn't care. The computer doesn't care. The only one that cares is the interface, right? The thing on the, the hard drive itself. And even then, it doesn't really care as long as it can get back to that same location some other time. All right, so... So 
So we can actually, we, well, there's a bunch of stuff we can do that's, that's pretty interesting. But what we can do is okay so the, the real question is how do we how do we get something out there how do we put something onto that drive onto that piece of memory actually I'm not talking about a hard drive at this point I'm actually talking about RAM or a register at this point Uh, we have direct access to to the L1 and L2 uh, memory, and th that'll be kind of handled a little differently. We're talking L3 or higher, but probably RAM. So, so I probably have direct access to L3, although it gets really complicated since it's a shared resource. So, but we'll, we'll maybe we'll talk about that later. So. Uh, so what we're really talking about is RAM. Oops. RAM. Okay. There's one that's called memory mapping. memory mapped I.O. What this does It has registers. Remember, registers are just memory locations. Oh. Well, let me. this and move it over here. Oh. <laughs> it didn't get the G. Uh, okay. Well, let's get the G now. Erase this. It has special memory. Now, these don't necessarily, when I say registers, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the CPU in this case. We could actually have registers in the RAM itself. Put that back. All right, so it, it has special memory registers. So here's an example. What it would do is the memory would come in. So we have, say we have, oops, say we have, uh, this is our RAM. We have some special register here. Here's our special register. Our special spec. Drawing really small. It's hard to read, I'm sure. But that says spec. So we're going to, it's going to come in. And we don't know where to put it. The CPU doesn't know where to put it, but it just sticks it into here, this memory location. And then there's a little controller. There's a, the interface is in here. There's this little, right? This little, uh, it's it's like a CPU, but we just call it some kind of a controller. Some kind of control. Yeah, there's no R in there, but that's all right. So what it's going to do is it's going to notice that there's a change. It's going to see that. And then it's going to take this and store it into our big bank of st locations. And there's a big bank of locations here. All right, we could just chunks of memory. 
this isn't the best way to think about it like this rectangle. Um, it's actually better to think about it uh, differently. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second when we get to how this actually works a little bit more. <clears throat> like how it's organized. So it's going to take it from there, and then it's going to shoot it into the spot that it's going to put it in. It then knows what that address is, and then it probably stores that address back here, and the CPU will come along and fetch that when it gets good and ready to do that. Or it'll send a signal to the to the um, the CPU telling it, "Hey, that the address is ready." So now you can know where that address is. Okay, that's memory mapped. This is fast because the CPU doesn't have to wait. It doesn't have to wait for the I/O device to, f or for the in this case the RAM, it doesn't have to wait for the RAM to to figure out where it's supposed to go. It just says, hey, store this, and then give me the address when you're done. And and so it can just do it quickly. And, it, and then this control unit probably, once it's stored that information, where's my mouse? So once it's stored that information, then it'll delete whatever's in here. So it'll zero it out so that the CPU knows it's available. Or there might be some other controller that'll control just what's available. That's very, very quick. All right, so the second one, the second way to do it is instruction-based I.O. Based I.O. So this uses special instructions to or from the CPU. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. What that means by instructions. So instead of right there just being a memory location that we can just have it. And it's actually this location here wouldn't necessarily have to be here in RAM. This could actually be in L3, and then the RAM controller is just constantly pinging, just going there and checking. Is there anything new here? Oh, there is. Well, then I'm going to be able to, I'm going to pull it out of there, I'm going to put it where I'm going to put it, and then I'm going to put back in the address, maybe in the exact same spot. And then the CPU will come along and see, notice that it's changed, and then make that change, or, you know, so that it knows that address. And then maybe it'll zero it out, I don't know. The reason why it's faster is the CPU doesn't have to get bogged down waiting for the I.O. to happen. It can, the I.O. can just happen when it's time. And uh, most systems, by the way, are use uh, memory map I.O. Because, like I said, uh, because of the speed. Um, now, in the instruction-based I.O., what would happen is, remember, when we get an instruction into our CPU, it goes into that control unit, that control unit's going to going to uh, notice that this instruction is a is an I/O instruction, and so then it'll immediately contact. It'll take it'll take the time to to contact the I/O device and then send the information or retrieve the information. Uh, there there are ways to make this faster uh, by by pipelining or looking ahead. Um, so, and the advantage to this one is it doesn't use memory space. So it doesn't require any extra memory. So we're trading speed for memory, or memory for speed. In fact, we're going to find out over and over again that we're always trading memory for speed.
memory. And speed. So if we went back up here to this formula here, right, it would take one instruction to do it, but then the average time per instruction is high. So it makes this go up. So although this went down, this would go up. And then these, this is going to stay the same. So, but it doesn't go up in proportion. So it's slow, it's slower. Where, where, when we're doing this I.O., uh, doing it with the instruction base, or that's with instruction based. We're using memory based. We don't have instruction, right? We just have one instruction, or maybe, you know, maybe one or two. It doesn't take a lot of instructions, but we're going to have more instructions because we're going to have to come back later and pick things up out of that memory location. The average cycles per instruction doesn't change. It should be just normal, or this should be the same. Hopefully, well, no, because it reduces the number of cycles per instruction as well, because it's just it's just going to keep going, just going to go right quick as quick as it can. So we're kind of messing with those levers. So this is we are going to be able to trade memory for speed, and they're kind of a, a against each other. There's a classic. There's a classic idea in computer science called uh, P and MP. Doesn't matter what that is, but um, when you, we were designing al designing algorithms, I went to grad school with a guy who was convinced that he had solved P equals MP. The problem is, which is, I mean, it's like a millions of dollar. You would you would be a millionaire overnight if you literally had solved that problem. But his problem was, yes, he had solved it, but it used so much memory for his system to work that it simply isn't feasible. So uh, he actually didn't prove that P is equal to NP. It was an interesting idea and very difficult to prove, actually, that he didn't find the answer. It's pretty cool. Okay. Just stick that in your quiver some places, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to remember. To, to find, like, five things, it would take, like, a whole hard drive. I mean, it was, it was just, it was crazy. It, it, it was a lot. But, okay. All right, so now let's, let's look at, actually, how, how to organize this data. Memory or memory organization. All right. So most of the time when we think about memory, instead of drawing it like I did here horizontally, I want to do this. I'm going to draw it like this all the time. And usually, and then I'm going to slice it up. So each the each of these is memory location. And that's important. So this is a memory location. Memory location. And we can think of that as a single register as well. But each memory location has uh, a unique address. And why is that important? 
Isn't it important to have a unique address? That seems weird, right? Well, if I want to be able to retrieve something from memory, it'd be kind of nice to know where it's at. And if there, if I say, well, it's, it's the, it's, uh, you know, uh, 101 Main Street. Well, I've left off a lot of things, right? Because I don't know what town that is, do I? So I have to figure that out, right? So that's what I would have to do in real life, right? If I had this address. And it's very similar. In fact, right, we don't, we do have unique addresses, right? Where you live, that address is unique to you. Well, maybe not to you, right? Because there might be other people who live there, right? But if you live in an apartment building, you could give the address of the apartment building and say which apartment it is. But it has to be unique so that you can get the mail there. In some ways, it's not unique, right? Because multiple people live in the same house. In this case, we only let one piece of memory live in each of the memory locations or registers. All right, so then the question comes, and the next one is, each of these locations, how big is it? Well, there's two different ways to do it, and those ways are indicative of the different ways to address. So, let's say it's one byte. Now, in Java, I happen to know in Java, I don't know in other languages, but in Java, if I want to store an integer, how many bytes do I, or how many, how many bits does it take? Well, the answer is 32 bits. Or four bytes. So what we would do, let's say we stored it here. It would be stored in four consecutive locations. And its address would be there. Or, in this case, right, since that's the top, location zero. This is location one, location two. Okay, let's not do that. Let's use, let's use Let's, let's be nice to you guys and let you use decimal values. Three, and then we would go four and on down the line to wherever we ended. This is interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk about why it's interesting. What's, what's some interesting stuff about it? There's, there's a... There's idea about RAM, and usually RAM doubles. So you can have a four terabyte chip or a four gigabyte chip, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then the next size up is eight, and the next size up is 16, and the next size up is 32. And there's a reason for this. Very rarely does it not do that. It's almost always multiples of, uh, uh, that are power something that's a power of two and the reason for that is because if um i'll come back and talk about that in a minute i'll come back and talk about that well we'll talk about why that is but for right now let's just say right so this is this is an example here of word addressable Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. This is not word addressable.
This is byte addressable. Because remember I'm saying that each one of these slots has a byte in it. So this is byte addressable. And in byte addressable, this case, there are four addresses per word. That's a technical term. So word, a word is how many bits or bytes, sometimes we talk about it either way, A CPU handles at the same time. I just realized something. Let's talk about it for a second. Well, well let me finish this this idea, right? So a word most computers and it will be defined by the operating system so if your operating system is Windows 11 if you're talking if it's a 64-bit system that means it's 64 bits per uh, word and it actually will be defined by your computer itself so the way to do that is to open up your settings here. I can. Go, this is for my computer. I go to system. Oh look, I have three monitors. You guys can see that. Um, what do I want to do? Go to about. And here in the about, I have 11th generation core i7. That's how many gigahertz it is. That's how much RAM is installed. Da, 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 da. I'm giving you all kinds of information about my computer. Ah, but the 64-bit operating system. Which means that my computer uses 64 bits to uh, in a word. It, it defines a word size as 64 bits. In this case we talk 32, but uh, that was just in this example, and that example would be for a uh, Java int. Okay. Let me talk for a second about why my style. Some of you have maybe m noticed something, is that I don't use PowerPoints. I don't like them. I'll use them if I have to, I guess. But I don't like them. Let me explain why. Because when people use PowerPoints, they put too much stuff on the screen. Let me explain. When I put up a PowerPoint that has a lot of things on there, what do you do? What would you do? Would you listen to me or would you just be busy reading it? I know the answer, because everyone does this. They read the PowerPoint and ignore the speaker. Because the speaker isn't saying the exact words that are up there. Unless the speaker just reads off the PowerPoint. And I don't like that. Because, well... What's, what am I good for? I can just put the words up there and let people read them. I don't need to even talk then. 
I was like, oh, I just put up the PowerPoint. You guys can read it when you're done reading. Let me know. That doesn't make for a very good in presentation, does it? A better way is to have just a few keywords, but don't worry about that. The other thing that's important, I actually got into an argument when I was in grad school. I got into an argument with a professor about PowerPoints in class and whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. And he argument, argued vehemently that I was wrong, that, that, I, that he believed that PowerPoints were the best way to transfer information. And he's right. And I don't use them still. Because if I just want to give you a bunch of information, I can put it on a PowerPoint and I can show it up there and you guys could read it and then you could get the information. The problem is, is what's the point of a lecture? To transfer a bunch of, to give you a bunch of information so you know it? No, that's not the point of a lecture. The point of a lecture is to get you to understand things. And the slower I go, the more you're going to understand. That's not completely always true. But I do the way I do it, including writing things down and drawing pictures and those kinds of things, because I think some of that helps us be able to abstract or think about it better. But also, I really do want you to be listening to what I have to say, because I'm choosing my words carefully. Hopefully. Not always. I'm, I'm not always perfect at it. I know. A professor telling you that they're not perfect. Yeah, go figure. Uh, I know I'm not perfect. Neither are you. I made a mistake once. It's been about 10 years, but I did make a mistake once. It's not true. <clears throat> I didn't really make a mistake. <laughs> uh, but nobody's perfect, right? So that means I'm going to misspell words, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put things up that are going to be hard to read. And that's okay. But I go slow because the, f the act of me working through this gives you time. When I t write out this definition of what a word is, that gives you time to think about what a word, what that means. It gives you time to kind of go off and explore that, some of that, that thinking. You know, maybe it's only 30 seconds, or maybe it's only 10 seconds, but it gives you time to think about it, and that's a good thing. All right, so I like that. Okay, that's my, okay, take off my ranting hat, put that on the hook. I might need that later, so I'm gonna keep, keep that close. Uh, that wasn't that much of a rant. Not to say that PowerPoints aren't good. They are good. They're used. They're great in certain circumstances, and I have used them before in lectures and in classes. And maybe we'll do that, actually, when we get to Maria, because Maria is going to have a ton of stuff to look at and think about and do. Uh, and I'm going to do things probably in a different way than you may be used to. Okay. If we use, okay, so, oh, uh, oh, that's what a word is. Okay. Ah, so this, this actually now, well, I took a, a moment to do this. So I'm going to come back now and talk about word addressable. Let me draw that. I'll draw a picture of what that looks like. Today we're using, oh, this is a 32-bit word. Sometimes also called word size. Okay, so if you ever heard the word word size, that's what that means, right? And so I'm going to use 32 bits because I don't want to have to draw all the, the 34s. Okay, so in this case, right, in the byte accessible, we put them all in bytes. Boom, 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 boom. And when we want to access this, we just go to zero, go to byte zero, and then it's going to just go ahead and grab the next four things because it, or, or we have to tell it to. Doesn't There's different styles and way to do it. But we just know that, hey, the next four bits, those are the ones to go to. Okay. Uh, 
Actually, I want to talk about this for a second. A hacker that knows what they're doing They could start here. This is actually this is actually really interesting, I think. They could start there on a word. They don't have access They don't have access to 4 and 5. Let's say they don't have access to 4 and 5, but they do have access to 2. So they go up to 2 and they get they say, "Hey, get give me four things. Give me a full word." And so it gets it's maybe this next word here, this blue word. It gets the first part of that blue word. That's a way for hacker, potentially for hackers, to get in and mess up your system. And yes, that's what level sometimes they have to go to to do that. This this would be called an over overrun or oh yeah. Uh, there's other ways to kind of handle this, but that's certainly one of the things it can do. There's a way to prevent this. Actually, pretty useful. It simply says that we ha that whatever whatever address we're looking at, we're not allowed to access anything in the byte addressable that's not evenly divisible by four. How hard is it to do that? Well, I could prove this to you, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> All addresses evenly divisible by four end with two zeros. All zeros. Is that evenly divisible by four? Yeah. It ends in two zeros. Four. Remember location four. A bunch of zeros, a one, and then two zeros at the end. It ends, double zero. The next one, eight. Eight ends in two zeros. It ends in one with three zeros, but okay, it, that qualifies still, right? 12. 12 is an 8 and a 4. So, and then two zeros. So we'll be a 1, 1, 0, 0. That's how it'll end. 16. We'll be a 1 with four zeros at the end of it. And then all the rest of the zeros before that. You can continue going. I can continue going. Indeed, all memory locations are all binary numbers that are evenly divisible by four end with two zeros. Guaranteed. So do I have to do any math whatsoever to verify that the address is evenly divisible by four? And the answer is not any. I can just look at those last two bits. If they're both zeros, I know it's correct. If they're not, I'm just not going to allow that memory location to be accessed which prevents people from doing this this garbage, right? This garbage here. Okay. So in this one in word addressable, if we have this same 32-bit word, it goes there. Now we have another one, uh, uh, right? That integer, right? Some integer value. And then this one goes down here. And I'd put the address on that as a one. And then two and three and all the on down the line. We don't have to worry about that. You can't address anything out of those four, right? You can you can only address something in the proper place. Right? It's not you're not allowed to grab this one and get four positions. Or sorry, this one 
you can't get this one and then go for right you can't do that it doesn't exist because the only way you can address it is there on the one or on the two or on the on the zero or on the one This idea, right, that force, the idea, sorry, here, the idea here that all addresses are evenly divisible by four, right, ends in zero, zero. So they, they end in a zero, zero. So that idea is called alignment. The only reason I'm defining that now is so that I can use it later if I ever need to. So the alignment means that if it's evenly divisible by by four, that's a start of a new word. That helps keep us aligned so that when we fetch, we can either fetch one, which maybe we only need, or we can fetch a full word. And that allows us to do things a little differently. Okay. Let's, let me, let me get this new thing here before I jump it out there. Let's, um, I'm going to go to new egg here and I'm just going to look up some RAM. Okay. Let's pick one here. Let's pick one that's a little easier to read. Okay, this one. Uh, well, we'll find out if we can figure this out. So, ah, overclockable. Uh, this, I'm not sure what those, I, I'd have to look it up to figure out what each of those numbers mean. Should have found one that was an example here. Or there should be specs down here. All right, so this actually helps a little bit. So this is a 32 bit, 32 gigs of memory, but it's really two 16 gigabits. So there's actually two chips there. That's important. Unbuffered, dual channel. Color, well, color might matter. Heat spreader, there you go. That's good stuff. Um, huh, it doesn't say. There's a way. Let's go back and see if we can find another one. This one's got the cool little lights on it. Let's see if this one will be better. Talking about, uh, ah, yes, okay, right here. This rank, 2RX8. Hmm, what does that mean? Let's go down and look at specs and see if we can find that 2R. Uh, <laughs> the specs here are worse than the one up there. That's interesting. Speed. Rank. Hmm, okay. Pin count. That's actually useful too. Okay. What does that mean? 2 R 
times 8. Well, let's go to Super User. I guess I'm accepting all cookies. Are these compatible? Ah. No. Oh, PC and P PC3 and PCL are two different. Ah, here we go. 1RX8 means it's a single rank module, and 2R times 8 means it's a dual rank module. Rank is a data block, which is 64 bits wide, without uh, creating created uh, da, 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 da. the x8 in them specifies the number of banks in the memory module higher the number of banks the fewer the chips in the memory module the better the reliability and power consumption okay so in short uh, this and this are not compatible with each other, but if it is only that da, 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 and you, they may be compatible with each other, but it's best to check the motherboard manufacturer's list of compatible RAM. Okay, there's a lot of definition in here, and we have to, to kind of break it down and, and talk about it. This means the number of ranks and this is the number of banks. Rank is a data block which is 64 bits wide. All right, so let me see if I can draw a picture of that. I didn't want to draw 64 or so. Well, half, half, and then have both of these. Half that, half that, and half this. So since each of these is 8 bits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, what this says is, I believe what this is saying is that I'm going to use two ranks here for each memory location. So this is zero, this is one. There might be something here, there might not be. I'm not sure that that's what that means. So let's not, not try to do this. There's a different way to talk about this. The book actually does it a little differently. So it, we don't see this exactly the way. That's not what I want. I want the big eraser. Here we go. Erase that. So what we're gonna what we'll do, let me let me do this a little differently. and give you a different example. Um, I 
Okay. So what it says, it gives this example, 4m x8. All right. So what that tells us is that when we look at this, we address it, each row is 8 bits wide. And that comes directly from there. And we put some dots in here. And we go down to the very bottom one which is four million minus one. And I should probably put this in quotes because it's always base two. Well, what's four million? Four million is, or one million, sorry, is two to the 20th. And we know that that's not exactly right. It's actually higher than that a million is. But 4 million is 4 times 2 to the 20th. Or we could say 1 times 2 to the 22nd. Right, because this is 2 to the 2nd, and we just add the two exponents together. Okay. Or we could actually even just take this away. We don't even need that. You just say 2 to the 22nd. Minus 1, though. Why minus 1? Because we started counting at 0. So when, if we see something that looks like this, the R way is a different way to think about it. It says each of these locations has 8 bits, and there are 4 million of them going down. And we could say, say 8k by 16. That means there's two bits per location. Or sorry, 16 bits or two bytes per location. Oh. Yep, okay. Uh, I just realized I hadn't checked the... Uh, the, the chat here. So I, I did that just now. Uh, now it's being funny. Okay, well, whatever. All right, so... <clears throat> okay. All right, so, okay. This is actually kind of interesting. One of the things we can do now is we could have a bunch of stacks like this, right? This 4M, 14, 4 million times 8. Okay. Let's assume that that's what we have. But let's look here. Let's say we have four of them. What we can do, because we have four different separate chips in RAM, or cards, or whatever, right? So we want to try to save these. So what we can do is something called interleaving. It's probably my one of my favorite words to learn. So that interleave. Let's go to Google and define that. Bring this over. Insert pages, typically blank ones between the pages of a book. 
That's the old way to do it. <laughs> Mix two or more data signals by alternating between them. Okay. Most of you have gone to a McDonald's through the drive-thru. It's interleaved. At least it's designed to be that way. Right? You could go to the inner lane or the outer lane. Well, those two lanes need to merge together. And the idea is you use the outside lane, or the inside lane, then the outside lane, then the inside lane, then the outside lane, then the inside lane, then the outside lane. And so each one they switch switches back and forth. That's called interleaving. That's a real world example of it. Otherwise, we start to talking about papers and all kinds of other things, right? Because we could do some things where, right, I printed off uh, two pages for the exam. And so then I take the first page, a first page and a second page, and I have them in separate piles. The good news is the printers actually handle all that stuff nowadays. We don't have to worry about it. Okay. So interleaving would say one, two, three, four. So we have four things that we want to put in there. Or we want to put a whole word. We're going to put it instead of... Remember, each of these is 8 bits wide. So we have a whole word. Oh, wait. I should actually number these differently. 0, 1, 2, 3. So although... Uh, although we can split that word across four different memory locations, four different chips. So they don't have to be saved altogether. This allows us to more quickly bring them in, right? Because we don't have, we don't, we can, we can do it in parallel. We can do it all at the same time, kind of. That's interleaving. Ah, I want to talk about a little bit about why why usually memory locations are in multiples of two. Because let's say I'm going to address this, right? So this has four. Oops, I don't want to use that. I'm going to use black. So remember, this is four million. Or two to the twenty second. Even if I had four of them like this, I'm going to put each word on a on, you know spread them out across the different memory locations. If I want to put a single number in for this, how big does it have to be? so that I can get all the way to the bottom. The answer here is 22 bits. Exactly, 22 bits. All right, let's increase it to eight. Eight megs, or eight million lo locations. That'd be two to the 23rd which would require 23 bits. How about 6? Six? 6 times 2 to the 20th. That's required 23 bits. there's going to be a bunch of locations that just don't exist. So I have to know that. And I have to control that. Turns out that it's just far easier to, to have those locations and know how many bits there are and they're all possible. 
because it makes it faster. So it's for performance reasons why it's done that way. It's actually really cool. All right. Oh, you know what? I had a couple questions. I need to go back and look at that. Uh, where is it? Okay. I had a couple questions. One was, can I resubmit an assignment? And the answer to, to that is always yes. Yes, you can redo uh, an assignment. Okay. Number two, the, the, so then the, the next thing is a question on uh, number two of our assignment. So let me, let me go to our assignments. We're on assignment four. Let's bring it up here. So number two, the truth table for a Boolean expression is shown below. Find the minimized Boolean expression for the function defined by the table here. So these don't care bits, right? That's what these are, just don't care spots. You can include them, but you don't have to. So they're, they can be useful if you want to include them or you don't have to, right? So in any case, I, I just don't want a really long Boolean expression. So if there's a, you, whatever Boolean expression, you can either include these, uh, which makes it simpler. My guess is it'll make it simpler, especially if you use a K-map, but that's, who knows? That's up to you guys what you decide to do. So, you'll figure that out. So, you can include the, these two results because I don't care if you include them. So, you can include them but, or you could exclude them. It's completely and totally up to you. So, then the next question, the very last question here was on number six. And the question is, Will I be going over what a null labor flip-flop is? And the answer is no. I'm giving you its behavior. When n equals zero, because there's two import, two inputs, an n and an l. When the n is zero, the flip-flop doesn't change. When n is one, then it will change to whatever value is on l the next state of the flip-flop. So that becomes, right, uh, I have to go back to my notes. Whatever's in L goes into S. Yep, yep, yep goes into S. So we set that to on. If it's a if it's a one, right? If L is a one, then it'll set it to set S to one. If it's a zero, then it'll set the reset will be turned on. So it's for you to figure out how uh, how that null labor needs to be hooked up with gates. So uh, Right, I am asking you to derive the characteristic table for the, well, this This one is the characteristic table, and this one is converting it in by adding gates and inverters. So you can just draw the SR flip-flop, and that won't, that doesn't change. We know exactly what that looks like. And then you to create the NL flip-flop, you're going to add some external gates and inverters. So that's that's what we'll do. That's what you'll do for those. So uh, for the characteristic table, right, is that you're going to draw a table. I'll give you an example. I'll just give you the, the stub for it probably here. And I'll say this is N. This is L. And this is Q. Right, so if I say, right, if they're both zeros, then what, I, what do I want to happen in these situations? My outputs, right? And then I go back and I say, all right, well, let's look at this one. What is that one going to do? Oops. And then what's that going to do? And then what's that going to do? 
and that will help you answer seven. So if you get six right and can answer that, that'll help you with seven. All right, let's look here. We have any questions? Any other questions? Let me look here. Um, no, but next time we're going to start out, and this is going to be important. Let me, arr, never see my mouse in this. This stands for machine architecture that is really intuitive and easy. Machine architecture that is really intuitive and easy. Marie. So uh, next time what we'll do is we'll go over how to download and install the things required to get Marie to work on your computer and also look at a website that also will emulate Marie as well. So we'll we'll cross that bridge next time and uh, otherwise I think we're we're done for the day. I think I've covered everything. Uh, oh there's one other thing to talk about but I do not have enough time so I have to talk about interrupts still. I talked about them briefly, but we will we'll we'll talk about interrupts a little bit more. So that's it for tonight. Otherwise, I will I will be here uh, broadcasting tomorrow, starting at seven o'clock. And otherwise, we should be good to go. I will be working on grading uh, assignment three tonight, and then four I will do over the weekend. So that four is done when your exam comes on Monday. So I believe that's our schedule. Let's look at my schedule here. Uh, so the week of September 19th has an exam this week. That's correct. And then we'll start looking at some of the things for Marie. And then... Uh, that'll be on Thursday. Uh, Friday will be, oh no, sorry, Monday, next week. We'll talk a little bit more about Marie and some of the other things about th uh, stuff, but we're going to move the, the lecture that I would normally do a week from tomorrow, and we, there will not be a lecture that day. Oh. Ah, I actually had the exam for this week, didn't I? On the schedule. Well, we've moved it off till next week. That's okay. But there will not be a lecture on Thursday of next week. All right, that's everything. I will talk to you guys again uh, tomorrow night.